Now let's go back to the EU. The EU now finds itself in the position where it's almost leadless. Mutti Merkel is gone. What are we going to do without her? She wasn't formally running the place, was she? But actually, in reality, politically, she was the driver uh, of, the, uh, of the EU, uh, much to the, the annoyance of President Macron. He now wishes to try and assume that mantle, uh, but won't be able to do so, because um, uh, he, frankly, doesn't have the character and strength to be able to do that, nor necessarily the credibility. The EU's got some big issues to try and manage. I'm not in you know, any way going to, to touch the issue of Brexit, because that's done and dusted. We're living with the effect of it. We can argue about that until uh, we go blue in the face. Let's look at the, actually the elements that are now impacting. For the EU, they've got some huge stra strains. And primarily one you saw coming out the past couple of weeks, but one we identified several years ago, a group called the Visegrad Group in the EU. And this consists of Poland, Slovakia, uh, Slovak, um, and uh, Czech Republic, and Hungary. And their line is very simple. We were not run by Russia for 50 years to be now swapped by, to be now run by Brussels. We demand you give powers back to us. And you saw last week the arguments of the Polish uh, courts as to actually who's actually got primacy. Is it EU law or is it actually a Polish law? Well, actually, it's quite clear in, the, uh, in all the agreements that have been signed, it would actually be EU law. But that's not the point. The point is those nations uh, are actually have been pushing for some time for more powers to be returned. If only Cameron had been paying attention to that, he would have actually had um, some in, quite, quite considerable uh, support rather than the rather, rather stupid dogmatic way he went about it. So it's going to cause some problems here as Brussels finds itself with uh, some considerable uh, difficulty in reaching unanimity. It's not a cohesive group. Are you trying to form, as France would like to have, the United States of Europe? Well, that's actually what you'll find a lot of the countries did not actually sign up for, um, including the United Kingdom, hence uh, we, our issue with Brexit. So the key issue now to look at at the EU is actually what's going to happen to the currency. Is the euro going to survive? Well, let's be clear. The answer is very, very simple. No, the euro is going to fail. Not yet. It may take some time to fail, but it will fail. Why? Well, to run a single currency, we have a single currency in this country, don't we, in the pound. To run a single currency, you've got to have free movement of capital. You know, money can be uh, passed down to Cornwall, gets spent, and then comes back through the banking system, back through, uh, through the, the city again. We have uh, a single tax system. Now, of course, we now have variations, because now we have the devolution. We've now got um, the cranky's love child uh, running Scotland, well, Mrs. Sturgeon, um, and uh, who I have to say has achieved one amazing thing. She managed to increase Scotland's deficit, so it's actually greater and rising faster than that of Greece which is actually quite a really quite remarkable effort on her part. Uh, but the point is this. Although they'll have difference in taxes, primarily the fiscal system is the same. It operates in the same way. So we can have a single currency. As long as you have uh, free movement of capital, you have harmonization of banking regulation, of financial regulation, and harmonization of the fiscal system, your single currency can work. There will be stresses and strains. That does not apply in the EU on a coordinated basis throughout the entire area. It will vary a lot. So on that basis, you're going to find those stresses and strains will eventually start pulling it apart. Are you ever going to get the Greeks to be paying the tax system, have a tax system in the same way as the Germans do? No, it's not going to happen. Um, and the Germans equally aren't going to let the Greeks get away with it and say, well, we'll just write off their debt and be done with it, even though, even though we all know that the Greeks aren't actually going to be able to pay that debt back. So we're in this strange sort of limbo where everyone's sort of, sort of ignoring it for the time being. Perhaps it'll all sort of go away. Well, it won't go away. It'll come back with a further crisis of confidence in the, in the euro a little bit later. There are things they can try and do about it. Uh, it's been done before. It was done in Belgium, oh dear, now it's about 70 years ago, but also in South Africa. You split the currency. So you have a domestic currency and you have an international currency. So in the case of Greece, you would maintain your debt in euros. The debt, in effectively, has now been made you know, uh, without date on it. So it's never-ending debt uh, because it's never going to be paid back but you just have a low-cost uh, endless debt just sort of sitting there, and it'll stay in euros. You then have the tradable olive or something like that, which devalues by 25%, and the Greek economy starts moving again. Unfortunately, they won't do that. It takes a level of imagination to try and carry that out. But I can imagine in due course, you may well find the euro splitting almost north-south between a Nero and a zero, um, as you'll find the southern uh, countries operating in a rather different manner. That won't happen yet, because there hasn't been enough pain to actually make sure that decision has to be made. So we'll try and stay with it for the time being. So that could happen in 10, 15 years, but it is a matter of time. Overall, what you can find, though, is the stresses and strains in the EU is in terms of differences in terms of, uh, of growth. And this is where you're now finding in terms of uh, Eastern Europe, 
uh, the problems they've had there and attracting more investment coming in because of the fall off in confidence. If they don't think the uh, EU is going to work as smoothly as before, uh, therefore, actually, people are holding up investment. Why is this? Well, one of the reasons is because we left. The EU does not want Britain to be seen as a success story by leaving the EU. Not necessarily out of personal bitterness, but actually just in terms of making sure the rest of the club stays together. Because they sit there and say, well, look, they've broken away and done quite well. Why don't we? In the same way, the EU doesn't want to actually see Scotland joining, because otherwise you'll find the same argument with that with the Catalans in Spain. It ends up as a dysfunctional political problem. So the EU is going to find that really quite difficult. However, what you have got, though, is a system whereby, despite uh, what's happened over the past 18 months, it has recovered, and you're seeing some uh, recovery at a fairly weak level overall. Um, the um, primary uh, benefits, obviously, have been some of the high-tech companies, but what you're now seeing, though, is a probably greater movement now towards some of the more domestic ones as you look for more, more of the value areas starting to pick back up again uh, from the areas that were so, really, so very heavily hit. So the EU is going to find trouble. Where does the leadership come from? Is it from Germany? Well, name one other German politician, apart from Mutti Merkel. And the answer is, well, it's really quite difficult, unless you happen to be German. You wouldn't know it. Um, so that sort of lack of dynamism, leadership, vision as to what happened next, every time the EU finds itself in that sort of position, it tends to actually economically lead to uh, 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 certainly a slowdown. And I can't see at the moment any particular drive as to which is actually going to be pushing the economy much faster. Bear in mind, uh, they've done uh, another huge amount of QE and they're going to continue that support. One of the continuing themes that we're going to see over the next few years is this level of uh, central bank support. If you go back, I would say about 30 years ago to any economics book, um, you'll actually find, uh, look up the, uh, the phrase there in terms of um, being able to have uh, quantitative easing and it didn't exist. The concept of it exists, but the actual term didn't exist because no one had really considered that actually was it going to be viable. And quantitative easing, of course, has been a great success. Uh, I'm afraid uh, Mrs. May was wrong. There is a money tree, and it was called quantitative easing. The trouble is that money tree can get stripped bare quite quickly. When we went through the financial crisis and we had quantitative easing, I remember as we drew towards the end of the worst period of that, just sitting down discussing, could we go through this again with another round of quantitative easing. And just everyone said, no, we can't do that again. It'll cost far too much. We'll lose credibility. And that's exactly what we have done. We didn't call it quantitative easing, but uh, it's exactly the same process. And that can continue until you lose credibility, until the emperors seem to be somewhat sartorially challenged, which in the case of Britain means people are losing faith in sterling. Now, they haven't lost faith in sterling yet. Uh, why? Well, because we've actually got quite a good history. We have never reneged on our debt. Every other major nation has at some stage. Yes, even the United States. Uh, well, not actually the government. It was actually some of the states. Um, but uh, we've actually got a good reputation of being trustworthy. But we are, and sterling is a relatively small currency. Although still a reserve currency, definition of reserve currency, countries will keep a an amount of, their, of sterling in their own reserves. Uh, and so whilst that's still participating, it gives us the opportunity to carry on with quantitative easing because people trust us and they will buy our debt. Push that too far, and it'll, find be, it'll be then much more difficult. And that's an issue that uh, Rishi Sunak is going to have to address with regards to the cost of that debt as well. Because although, if you look at the interest levels in terms of being so low, a small rise in interest uh, rates will actually impact on our debt, even though a lot of it is long-term priced. Um, nonetheless, it will have an impact. To give you some idea, um, the latest figures we had are showing that uh, because of the... the, uh, the, the uh, Debt Management Office, which is down, based down in South Croydon. There's nothing particularly interesting in South Croydon, I find, but the Debt Management Office operates independently from the Treasury, um, and their job is solely to manage the debt. And one of the key things they've been doing is re actually rescheduling a lot of the debt, turning over a lot of longer-term, more expensive debt into much, much cheaper debt now. Very good opportunity, and locking it at a low price. Um, however, any increase in, uh, in interest rates will impact on that. So currently, our interest rate payments are around about 42 to 45 billion a year which is just slightly less than our defense budget. It would take very little in terms of interest rate movement to find ourselves up at a position of about 60 to 70 billion a year just in interest rate payments. Um, and that would actually cut out, that's actually more than you'd be getting in excise duties in terms of income for the government. So we've got to be really very careful actually how they manage to do that. So the EU's operation of quantitative easing, uh, they've been able to carry it on. Why? Because it's frankly backed by the Germans and they'll carry on doing it. They'll keep, they'll keep the, the game going. However, 
if people start losing faith in what the European Central Bank can do, and there's further strain on, uh, on the euro, that's when you're going to find any of those uh, areas and find it much more difficult to finance themselves. You cannot keep on just uh, using quantitative easing endlessly.